Yeah, so uh, what I'll be talking about is, is given this, the, uh, and this is work done with a uh, very talented postdoc Ayansha uh, Rai Chaudhary and the student Satoshi Das Gupta. And it appears in this uh, recent uh, archive uh, paper. So my talk is going to be about uh, active elastic uh, systems, active elastic renewable systems, so constantly undergoing turnover and uh, uh, you know, unbinding and binding back to the medium. Uh, and these systems exhibit, I'll show, exhibit uh, tension force chains or stress fibers as the biologists like to call it. Uh, and they, uh, and these occur as, as uh, finite time singularities. So this is what my attempt will be in this, in this talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it also exhibits what we call fragile elasticity. Okay, and uh, and it's these interesting sort of uh, mechanical aspects that I'd like to talk to you about today. Yeah. So uh, the so the the system that I'm going to focus on is the interior of a typical cell, uh, and the interior of cells such as these are uh, suitable in vitro systems where the cell is now plated on a micro fabricated substrate you know for easy uh, experiments uh, to happen uh, these systems uh, provide an opportunity to study rheology of this active renewable matter and uh, i think it's uh, it should attract the attention of rheologists i think uh, i mean there's been a lot of work in this field but but the aspect of renewability has not been uh, uh, addressed so far um, mainly because renewable systems are difficult uh, it's difficult to make in vitro realizations of renewable systems um, and these these systems as i said exhibit these system spanning uh, force chains okay what what is labeled here are actin filaments actin fibers and you see they form really bundled uh, you know uh, uh, line like structures okay and uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about it's these uh, system spanning uh, actomycin force chains that I'm going to show uh, uh, emerges as a result of two aspects one is active contractility coming from actomycin and the other is turnover of myosin in a stress strain dependent manner okay so these are the two aspects that I'm going to talk about uh, Further, these you'll see that these uh, lines, these singular lines, are sort of held at the boundaries, okay? And they are held at specific sites at the boundaries, so they call focal adhesion sites, and that's also going to be a crucial aspect of it, okay? So there's some internal, um, you know, uh, polymerized lines that uh, that emerge, and these lines propagate all across the scale of the cell, and at the boundaries. They are held together, or they're anchored by at special points. Okay, so this is the this is the uh, system that I'm going to look at. Uh, these actomycin, as I said, uh, they form cell span uh, cell spanning patterns like so, and indeed this is responsible for the overall shape of the cell, their size, and their deformability. Okay, so it's very crucial for for the biology of these of these cells. Uh, further, it's uh, a, a lot of us. Uh, imagine that this architecture uh, actually controls internal organization of organelles okay? and this is an aspect which is just being studied now oops okay so so uh, yeah so the the uh, wide variety of mechanical responses that these these uh, these cells show uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, you know it's a consequence of this active cytoskeleton that I'm, I'm looking at here okay these green lines uh, and uh, as I said they are uh, these the interior is formed by cell spanning non equilibrium cell uh, self assemblies of actin and myosin okay filaments such as these um, now these uh, what's crucial to realize is that these actomyosin filaments they act both as force generators and force sensors okay that is they they both exert forces and they sense forces and the latter namely sensing forces is done by a strain dependent unbinding okay so that's the that's what makes it very different from 
uh, regular uh, inactive materials. Okay? Uh, and it's this uh, sort of contactility and remodeling that makes this system uh, uh, sort of uh, an adaptive mechanical system. Okay? That is, it adapts to external forces that act on, on this. Uh, uh, and and in, in, in sort of uh, you know, changing its mechanical properties depending on what uh, external forces are added are, uh, are uh, applied on this this the the cell typically and this is something I'll show it uh, typically uh, explores the limits of uh, mechanical stability okay and that's what I'm going to talk about fragility is is precisely that about exploring the limits of mechanical instability okay so now a little bit about the phenomenology okay oh I forgot what I wanted to show you here is of course this is one aspect of what this uh, marvelous actomyosin architecture in the cell does okay giving rise to these uh, four chains or singular lines that you see here but the other one is co uh, coexisting with this the singular structure you find that it has these excitable waves that are generated so you have a coexistence of these singular lines and excitability happening in the same system yeah and what we'd like to show is how do local active forces drive uh, this into a steady state which exhibits both this kind of architecture and excitability okay so, okay, so now a little bit about the phenomenon two slides on the on a necessary phenomenology of actomyosin uh, so please bear with me uh, so the 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 chains that we are talking about are built from actin filaments these red lines which have a certain polarity they have a minus end and plus end because that depends on the local structural polarity of the of the filament and there's a bunch of myosin motors which was discussed uh, in yesterday's uh, talk myosin motors which due to a, uh, by uh, atp or chemi uh, hydrolysis or chemical fuel it it uh, drives movement like so for instance this myosin head moves towards the plus end and therefore the filament moves uh, in this direction okay similarly here when a myosin when a bundle of myosins uh, latch onto actin filaments like so a pair of actin filaments like so these heads move towards the plus end here and this one moves to that plus end therefore this filaments contract okay they come together here you can see in this architecture there will be an extensile uh, strain okay the filaments move away from each other so typically in a collection of actin filaments and these myosin you get currents like this you get states of contractility where the filaments are compressed you also get states of extension now there's an interesting difference between these two things and that is the following that is the these filaments can are easy to compress but not to extend Okay, so they're anisotropic in their response, uh, and that anisotropy is uh, a consequence of this buckling, and it's precisely this nonlinear buckling that gives rise to an overall contractility in a random meshwork. So if we have a random meshwork of these filaments, this was shown by uh, explicitly by Mata Lenz and uh, Pierre Ronsarov, <coughs> that a random collection of these actin filaments upon which you put uh, myosin uh, bundles of myosin will overall have a net contractile response okay so that's so uh, so now so what you should take home from this is that actin filaments form a meshwork they're held together by cross linkers which gives this meshwork some elasticity and on top you put myosin and myosin the net uh, consequence of myosin is to apply contractile stresses okay the contractility, as I said, is a consequence of this asymmetry between extension and compression. Okay, so that's this is the force generation aspect of uh, of actomyosin. Uh, the other was about force sensing, and so just a, a few words about that. Again, here now is the schematic of this actin mesh, a random meshwork held together by cross linkers, which gives it elasticity. Imagine you have a collection of different kinds of of uh, myosin red and blue which uh, bind to this meshwork and uh, they they bind with the rate kb and they unbind with the rate ku okay it turns out that if you apply an external stress onto this the rates ku or, uh, or the rate ku can alter dramatically okay 
so this is called catch bond behavior and uh, this is what uh, 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 this is this is the uh, idea of force sensing that is some some of these myosin filaments exhibit a catch bond behavior if you look at this experimental curve of the bond lifetime versus the applied force then that typically in, in most cases go increases with increasing force and then typically saturates okay so the so it holds so when you apply a force it catches on stronger because okay, it's like a seat belt or something okay which, which, uh, beyond a certain extreme force it of course detaches okay? so that's the that's the aspect we'll be talking about the catch bond aspect um, some some molecules indeed show the slip bond which is that you apply a force and then they give up very easily okay so so the, so this is the two key words that people use to describe the uh, stress dependent uh, release one is called a catch bond behavior typically exhibited by a lot of these motors and slip bond behavior okay, okay so these these are the two aspects that i wanted phenomenological aspects that i wanted to uh, describe the force generation and the force sensing okay so now let's try to uh, address a sharp question okay so what we want to ask is how do local active forces that act on this actin and myosin uh, how do they drive uh, dynamic long-range force patterning as I showed you in that picture of the cell earlier and indeed how does it form how does it give rise to the coexistence between these stress fibers and excitability um, so the two scenarios that uh, that one could address this question here is the schematic of a cell with this random meshwork of uh, of uh, of actin and let's have a thought experiment where I don't have any myosin in the system now now I put myosin uh, on onto the system here and what we want to see is whether it's myosin spontaneously segregates in, into myosin rich regions and myosin poor regions okay so the myosin rich regions have bundles of actin because they compress things locally and the myosin poor regions uh, suffer from expansion Okay. So this is the kind of, uh, of question you want to ask. Uh, an equivalent question, and this is what we'll focus on, is to take two different kinds of, of myosin, myosin A and myosin B, both of which are motors. And what you want to start off with is a uniform distribution of myosin A and myosin B on this mesh. And you want to see whether they spontaneously segregate into a myosin A rich region and a myosin B rich region. Okay. So, so that's the, and both this, this, the driving force for these things is, is going to be local contractility and uh, uh, the differential contractility between myosin A and myosin B and the differential turnover or unbinding from myosin A, uh, of myosin A and myosin B. Okay, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll focus on this just to keep one story, but the, what I'm going to tell you is, is equally uh, valid uh, for this, this scenario. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the background has crosslinkers, and therefore the background is an elastic uh, substrate. Yeah, we'll assume that the crosslinkers don't unbind over the, and that that's fairly valid assumption. So the background is an elastic system. Okay. So again, just coming to your point here, that um, so how do you describe the, uh, how do you provide a hydrodynamic description for that system that I'm talking about? The background is uh, an elastic system, so it can be described locally by uh, a displacement field u which is a function of both space and time and from u of course you can uh, define uh, a linear strain okay epsilon ij which is a strain which is which are just how u varies over space and time okay constructed from derivatives of, of u uh, epsilon there is just defined as the compression okay is a trace of this uh, of the strain uh, tensor okay uh, so, so that's the, going to be the description of the of the actin mesh, okay, elastic actin mesh. Uh, the equations that uh, that mesh in the overdamped limit, the equations that this mesh is going to uh, uh, going to obey are that the local velocity of the of the mesh should be equal to the forces, and the forces are just the divergence of local stresses. The local stresses is a combination of the elastic meshwork. Because there was a old, there are cross linkers which provide elasticity. There is an active stress coming from myosin which binds and provides local contractile stresses, and there's some dissipative uh, stress which is proportional to the strain rate. Okay. Uh, now 
in this, the only thing, this is known, this is going to be linear elasticity theory, this is just viscous damping, okay? So the, these two are, are uh, well-known ingredients, but what is new here is this active stresses. New meaning has been studied for the last 10 years, but it's, it's uh, okay. And these active stresses are going to be functions of the myosin density and the local actin density. Okay, and we'll have to, this is the, going to be the phenomenological input. We'll have to provide forms for how the sigma active depends on these two variables. Okay, so this is, this is a simple force balance. Uh, now, of course, there's myosin which binds and unbinds and binds and unbinds. So they have the dynamics of their own. The local dynamics of myosin is given by a direction. is carried by the, lo the, the local velocity of the mesh. Uh, a diffusion term with the diffusion coefficient d. And then there is the binding unbinding okay so this is just this accounts for the local mass balance the binding and binding is typically as we showed has a catch bond behavior therefore it is strain dependent yeah so these two in in these yellow squares are the phenomenological inputs they're go going to do we're going to place on this rather general uh, elasticity theory Okay, so as I said, the elastic stress is just linear elasticity. So sigma e, the linear stress, is the derivative of a free energy with respect to strain, and it just has a bulk elastic. So that's a bulk modulus coupled to the compression, and the shear modulus compared, uh, coupled to the deviatoric strain. Okay, uh, this is a coupling between the actin density and the and the the local strain, uh, which which is a statement that the mesh density is slaved to the elasticity, okay, slaved to compression. By locally compressing the mesh, I'm increasing the density of the actin filaments. Okay, so that's that relation. So this, this is a rather well-known, uh, uh, well, uh, so this is, this, is, this is standard elasticity theory, okay. Um, for, the, for the ingredient that we need for, uh, to describe turnover, is, described, is uh, discussed here. So this is the rate of, of binding, which depends on the actin density, and the rate of unbinding, okay? So, and we'll take the rate of unbinding to be a catch bond, and so strain, strain dependent. And this is the form we take, this is the typical Hill form. Uh, epsilon, remember, is the compression, so it's negative. Alpha i being, alpha being greater than zero, suggests as a catch bond, alpha being less than zero suggests as a slip bond. Okay? So you can see the consequences of this, of the state of the, of the cytoskeleton as a consequence of both uh, contractility, which I'll come to later, and the strain dependent unbinding. Okay. Uh, huh, I'm missing a slide. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So it turns out that Okay, before, before I come to the, uh, uh, the form of the active stress, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, suppose you have two different, so this, this was, you know, this equation holds for both the species of myosin, myosin A and myosin B. And it turns out that is easier to go to sum and difference variables, so that's the, that is the equation uh, here. So again, force balance. That is, the local velocity is equal to the forces. And this is the equation for, this, for the myosin A plus myosin B, the net density of myosin A and myosin B. And this is the equation for the difference variable. Okay? We're going to concentrate on this because we, I want to describe segregation. Okay? So, that's, so this is going to be the crucial, uh, it'll be the interplay of this equation with that that provides all the magic in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the results here. Okay? Okay, so now I've talked about uh, uh, about uh, the uh, the unbinding or the turnover of uh, of myosin. What I need to put is the other ingredient, namely the uh, force generation. The force generation, as I said, is a function of the actin density and and local actin uh, myosin density, and uh, it, it's, it could just be taken as a as a you know more myosin, more contractile stresses. So it's some a curve which linearly increases and then saturates. Okay, so it's a very simple kind of uh, uh, kind of form. So that's what I'm going to take here. It just li it depends linearly on the densities of myosin. Uh, but it also depends on actin density. And actin density, remember, is slaved to the local compression. So I can unpack this by sort of expanding about the uniform uh, actin density and generate 
these strain dependent terms okay and that okay these these strain dependent terms are a consequence of just expanding that this quant uh, quantity about the uniform uh, uh, mass density of the of the active the consequence of this is to uh, is to renormalize the original stress strain curve okay the original stress strain relation remember that we started off with linear elasticity theory where the stress was proportional to the strain okay via this elastic model i b and mu okay but the but the inclusion of uh, of uh, active stresses and the expansion of and the dependence of uh, the active stress on actin density immediately renormalizes the form of the uh, stress strain relation okay well, yeah right so that the nonlinear elasticity emerges from the, from this yeah 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 exactly but that is because of the active part that's because of the active part so that means also it could be it can be nonlinear it could be so right so we, uh, so it turns out that uh, the cytoskeleton in the actin mesh with cross linkers behaves like an elastic uh, system yeah 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 uh, for very very large stresses it because the cross linkers start unwinding and then of course something else happens okay so so the effect of this uh, of this active stresses is to is to do two things no three things it provides an active pre stress okay which depends on the local density of uh, the myosin, bound myosin of row 1 and row 2 it renormalizes the uh, elastic modulus b and i'll give the form later but is again an activity dependent renormalization of b uh, it becomes softer as you can imagine okay and it also provides uh, a nonlinear elasticity theory which stabilizes the potentially softening of this of this elastic uh, modulus okay in fact what 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 you can see here for instance is that uh, the uh, the elastic modulus which is the coefficient of the linear term there gets renormalized by this quantity okay this is the bare the passive part which depends on the on the concentration of cross linkers but because of activity there's a softening of the of the elastic modulus uh, regions with large values of of uh, phi or right if, if myosin 1 is more or myosin a, a is more in certain region those regions will have very small values of b which can be driven to zero and in fact negative okay and that's where all the the interesting thing is going to be okay so uh, so activity as i said drives the, the elastic modulus to to become softer uh, and in fact it it uh, it be, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it becomes uh, you know soft and it has uh, an interesting set of, mecha of mechanical properties for instance this could be driven uh, uh, you know by making rho and phi large i can uh, drive this to have zero value uh, and and zero value is a different kind of uh, elasticity is no longer elliptic elasticity is no longer standard elasticity of a material but it gets driven to what's called a hyperbolic elasticity okay uh, uh, it also you also find that for instance in the regime where for instance this is uh, the effective b is zero uh, these systems are highly uh, oxidic okay that is the poisson ratio can be negative okay uh so which which means that if i uh compress in this direction okay so this is the conventional thing is if i compress in this direction it will exp expand in the perpendicular direction but in these oxidic systems if i for instance uh, uh you know pull it apart in these directions this one can go up. okay so okay uh this the statement of uh, of uh, hyperbolic elasticity has to do with uh the characteristics forming uh, uh are uh, aligning as force chains uh that means that in conventional elasticity for instance if i have a material here if i have a material here I apply a point force a point load at this point then the stresses diffuse dif uh propagate diffusively in the material however in hyperbolic elasticity obtained when b here is is close to zero okay the stresses propagate along rays okay and uh, there's a very uh, uh, there's a very strict uh, directionality associated with this and this is what is is associated with the emergence of force chains as has been observed in granular media yes, 
Uh, what is the number of uh, Sisley? Yeah. Yeah. Elastic video, you will see that the, this uh, thing amplitude decays as 1 over r to the d or d minus 1? Mm -hmm. okay. d minus 1, right? d minus 1. But then in uh, anomalous elasticity, you have you will have a completely different behavior. Huh. And uh, also in a, a length scale will emerge. That up to certain scale, you have one behavior. I see. And then uh, at a later uh, scale, you have 1 over r to the d minus 1 behavior. I see, I see. But, but, uh, but maybe these, okay, these but systems are probably also susceptible to that. Uh, could be, but so these are overdamped systems, right? I mean, in the case that you're talking about, are they overdamped systems? No, they are. So, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So dense. Uh, yeah, the, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can discuss that. Okay. Yeah. So, so I hope you got the, uh, the thing that because of a combination of contractility and binding and binding, you get this. Uh, very interesting mechanical uh, behavior of uh, softening of the elastic modeling, uh, leading to even being driven to, uh, you, you know, hyperbolic and parabolic elasticity. So that's the that, that's that's what I wanted to say here. Okay, the other aspect that is in, uh, interesting arises by doing a linear stability analysis of those dynamical equations that I talked to you about. The dynamical equations, which was about strain and the density of bound myosin and. Uh, Bound myosin. Okay, so uh, what we find is that, uh, for instance, just look at this. This is the uh, phase diagram in the elastic passive elastic modulus, so the bare elastic modulus, in the x-axis versus the contractility average contractility in the y-axis, and you can see that for very large uh, elastic modulus, if the, if the original uh, uh, actum, uh, the original actin mesh is very rigid, a lot of cross linkers then that system is going to be very stable to you know, the binding and binding of myosin. And if it is very weak, however, the local binding of, of myosin is going to apply huge contractile stresses, and that gives rise to a sort of contractile instability. The whole thing just collapses. Okay? In, between, in, in between these two extremes is an interesting region where the two myosin species segregate from each other. Okay? And so what happens is I start with the, with the uniform distribution of myosin A, myosin B. Over time, uh, there is a spontaneous segregation of these two uh, stresslets or, or density fields corresponding to myosin A and myosin B. This is the dispersion curve of that, which shows you that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, unstable to uh, the formation of segregated domains. But this should come as a surprise because there was no interaction between the two species of myosins. Okay? The segregation is not as a consequence of some gradient of chemical potential, which is the usual segregation of two uh, components. But this is coming because of the, its interaction with the underlying mesh. And so the driving force of that turns out to be the, the elastic stresses stored in, uh, in, the, in the meshwork. And you can show that to, uh, uh, that to linear order, this acts as a Lyapunov function. That is, that this quantity W dot, namely, th this is the el uh, elastic power, that is a decreasing function of time. Okay, and so it's this elasticity of the underlying mesh which is which connects the two different species of myosin that gives rise to the segregation. Okay, a sort of interesting feature is that the segregated phase uh, has you know uh, this interesting. So this this is showing the segregation, right? I start off at with where uh, you have a homogeneous uniform distribution of myosin A, myosin B. The segregation in this regime, the segregation instability de develops and you start picking up a non-zero wave vector which, which grows exponentially fast. Okay? But if you look at the, uh, at the segregated strips of myosin A, myosin B, then they have this peculiar form. I look at the density of myosin A, let's say, within that, within that segregated region, it shows a peak in that. But myosin 2 also shows a peak, okay? And this is because of, which is different from oil and water, okay? So it's, it's an interesting uh, observation here. And this is because that both myosin A and myosin B have catch bonds, okay? And that's the moment you have one catch bond, one slip bond, the peak of, my, of uh, myosin A will be separated from the peak of myosin B, okay? But now what happens when you have, when you have 
so, so far it is all about uh, linear regime, okay? The linear segregation following the initial homogeneous uh, configuration. Okay, so you now find it, uh, so now as time progresses, of course non-linearity is kicking and you can ask how does, how does the uh, pattern of myosin and myosin A and myosin B evolve over time when you include the nonlinear uh, nonlinear uh, terms in the equations of motion. Okay. So in conventional uh, phase segregation, let's say oil and water, uh, this is the scenario. You start off with a homogeneous mixture of, uh, let's say, oil and water. Uh, or two different components. Uh, it quickly undergoes a segregation at low enough temperatures. You have the pink region segregated from the blue. And nonlinearities then go to create large macroscopic domains, okay, such as shown here. So the domains just increase in time and typically go as some t to the one third. Okay. What happens here? What happens here is the following, and this is, this is uh, quite uh, peculiar and is, is a consequence of the uh, activity in the system. What happens here is that the initial linear segregated uh, domains as shown here, okay, very quickly shrink to these singular lines. Okay? And that's because uh, there are two aspects uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the physics that is different from the, from the usual part. One is that there was the sigma, there's an active pre-stress. Okay? So, so row one is the more contractile element compared to row two. Contractility then makes this domain shrink. So if you create, you start with a domain like this, contractility then makes the domain shrink, okay, because of the contractile forces. And so these growing patches then very quickly in a finite time reduce to these singular lines, okay, because of contractility. So it's, it, it, initially, it initially linearly segregates, but then contractility pulls it back in. Okay. Okay, and uh, okay, and it does so in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. It does so by uh, by this uh, by the appearance of these finite time singularities. That is, as as uh, that is, as soon as you know, as soon as it grows to a certain uh, extent and and accumulates enough of the contractile species, it starts the the contractile stresses due to this enhancement of the of the myosin A shrink the growing domain and it shrinks and, and it, uh, it, it, it has, you know, the, it shrinks and it has a certain scaling form where the density of myosin A, for instance, has this kind of scaling behavior, okay? The width of the domains uh, shrinks as T minus T0 to the power of one third, where T0 is this finite time singularity. Okay, so, so I hope you get the picture. In, initially, a homogeneous phase segregates the segregated domains accumulate more and more of the contractile species. The contractile species then brings the domain back to uh, thin lines, okay? Thin singular lines. And the thin singular lines have a certain scaling form which one can derive from finite time analysis. So th this analysis, is, I must say, uh, was done, the scaling form it was obtained by solving the one-dimensional form of these equations using a, using a, a matched asymptotics and uh, dominant balance uh, techniques uh, to give rise to these uh, these scaling variables. Uh, in two dimensions, it turns out that it's slightly more complicated. One needs to include uh, anisotropic stresses, uh, which arise because these these actin actually is a, is a filament. Okay, and so these contracted regions of, uh, of actin as shown here, for instance. Okay, the contracted, contracted regions of actin are actually filaments, okay? So when you get to this configuration, you have to include anisotropic, uh, interact, uh, anisotropic contributions to the stress. And if you do so, you get the same kind of uh, physics. So it turns out that what you find is that if you start with, with uh, a homogeneous um, distribution of uh, myosin A and or myosin 1 and myosin 2 embedded in a random meshwork, then you quickly start getting these lines, singular lines in 2D. In 3D, they form singular lines and planes and so on and so forth. Okay, okay. so in the, in, the, in the extreme limit, once they form these singular uh, structures, then you can ask what is the mechanical, uh, what, is, what is the 
mechanics or what, what is the force balance, mass balance and torque balance for these singular lines. And what you find is that you can derive uh, active versions of the young Laplace equation, which I won't tell you about here. But it's, it's an interesting thing. For instance, if you take this, this just says that the elastic pressure difference between, so this is the singular line I'm talking about. PE here is the elastic pressure difference between this region and that region. PA is the uh, active pressure difference between that region and this region. And, uh, and this sum of the things, so the tension multiplied by curvature plus these jumped, jumps in pressure across the line is proportional to the normal component of the velocity of the line. So for static lines, okay, you can see that this would be the active version of the young Laplace equation. Okay? And, and uh, yeah, so the inter interesting consequences of that. Uh, you can also take these lines and study uh, the dynamics of lines and look at the merger between two lines, whether the lines go, th go, through, uh, go through each other, okay, and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a whole rich dynamics which we are currently studying. But here is an experiment which shows the dynamics of these, of these lines, okay. Uh, these are cells which are again embedded in microfabricated uh, environments and these lines here are actin lines which are, which are bundled because of, of myosin. And if you look carefully, you can see that these, you can see this one line here which has emerged from that bundle and then moves. There are lines which coalesce and so on and so forth, okay. So this is a, a beautiful recent experimental work by uh, Vidnyar et al in this and uh, this is an early simulation um, of um, by Francois Nedelec's group uh, which shows these lines okay you see is now looping but you see the, the, the formation of these of these singular lines um, sir oh well <laughs> okay uh, yeah, so now you could, uh, you know, in a cell, of course, there's a finite boundary. Five minutes? Yeah. In a cell, you have a finite boundary. And so the question now is, when you have these bunch of lines within, in the interior of the cell, how do they interact with these boundaries? In fact, these boundaries are called focal additions, and they anchor these lines. Remember, this is what I was telling you in the first slide. Okay. So including these anchors at specific points, you can stabilize these moving lines and they form this web-like structure. And here is what I meant by fragility. The, the whole network of these lines, which are stabilized because of the anchoring at these precise points, uh, changes when you displace these anchoring points by a slight amount. Okay? So even the slightest uh, displacement of these anchoring points will change, will remodel this actin meshwork. Okay, and this is this is what is what is uh, called fragile matter. Uh, uh, recall that this fragility is different from the fragility in granular media. That in granular systems, the fragility is due to the compression between grains. Here, the fragility is because of the tension between the lines. Okay, so that. Okay, here are some experiments which I uh, won't go through, but they they are reflective of the kinds of analysis that we have uh, done uh, and maybe I'll skip this in the interest of time uh, or do I have the time? Okay, oops. <laughs> uh, okay, I have comments. Okay, so so far I've been talking about these emergence of these singular lines which are anchored at the boundaries by these, by the, uh, by uh, special anchoring molecules such as focal additions. And remember in the first uh, or the second slide, I told you about the coexistence of these, uh, of these lines with excitability. Yeah. And this is what I'd like to uh, demonstrate here. Again, so what I've written down here is the, uh, is taking the dynamical equations, namely the equations for the strain and the density of bound myosin and then linearizing it and writing this down as um, uh, as, a, uh, as a time derivative of the Fourier components of the strain uh, and the two density fields with a dynamical matrix. Okay, So this is just the linearized uh, Fourier transformed version of the uh, dynamical equations. The reason we, one does this is that this here is the dynamical matrix and once you look at this, it turns out that the active contributions to this to this uh, dynamical matrix make this matrix non-Hermitian. Okay? 
and it's the non hermeticity of this that gives rise to this interesting excitable phenomena the as you move in param so a consequence of the non hermeticity of the dynamical matrix is the fact that the eigen vectors which tell you how perturbations propagate the eigen vectors no, need not be orth uh, orthogonal okay and in fact as you change parameters the eigen vectors can the eigen vectors can coalesce okay two of them can coalesce or three of them can coalesce to give rise to what's called exceptional points okay uh, and uh, and the the exceptional points are an interesting thing if you look at the face portrait uh, a typical first face portrait about these uh, exceptional points exceptional points to remind you are regions in uh, parameter space where the eigen vectors coalesce okay if you look at the face portrait then then this is the one the fixed uh, the linear stability analysis tells you that there should have been a putative fixed point here okay however the fa the phase portrait gives you flows like so okay so if i start with an initial condition here in this variable v and u then uh the flow lines will take you all the way you know very far and then come back and if you start from from uh, close by any point here okay you're, you you're driven all the way for very far then you pick up nonlinearities and then no, the nonlinearities can drive you to another to another unstable surface okay so this is what happens typically in uh, in the vicinity of uh, uh, these exceptional points uh, you find and this is well known in fluid mechanics for instance and uh, it's it's known that linear analysis sort of does not work in the vicinity of these ex exceptional points but what's interesting for uh, active matter systems is that uh, the exceptional points are sort of gateways to traveling waves okay and what we find here for instance you get these traveling in 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 between the contractile instability and the oscillatory phase you start you start getting traveling waves as shown here and i'll play a movie if i can oops can't see the cursor okay anyway i can't seem to find the cursor but uh, this would have shown you traveling waves okay and then you get another phase in in the again in the vicinity in the boundary between the oscillating and the contractile instability you get another phase called a swap phase which is a standing wave okay where you have large concentrations of myosin a myosin 1 okay and low concentrations of myosin 1 there and it sort of swaps like that okay it's a standing wave that you get um yeah so this so this happens in coexistence with uh Uh, with the stress fibers that I talked to you about. Okay, so so I'm going to uh, end the talk with the fi uh, final few remarks. So what I uh, yeah uh, now the cytoskeleton is built up of more than actin myosin. It's also built up of microtubules, which are very large compressive uh, filaments within the cell. Okay, and so one could ask, what is the uh, how would you now describe the mechanical properties of a cell interior, which is comprised both of actin myosin and microtubules okay uh and this is something we just started looking and the reason why this is interesting is the following um okay uh, there has been a recent proposal by ingber that the interior of the cell behaves like what's called a tensegrity structure yeah uh, where where the microtubules are rods okay and they hold all compressive load and the actin held with myosin forms tension okay forms uh, rubber bands okay and uh, uh, this tensegrity structure was a old uh, was an old proposal and a challenge by buckminster fuller uh, who challenged the architecture and the engineering community to build structures such as these which are held by by tension by the strings okay and they have compressive elements which are isolated okay this is so for instance here is a structure where you can you know you can deform it and this thing will bounce back okay these are amazing amazing structures uh i i just saw the structure out there in the in the building and this is a tensegrity structure okay if you just if you, once you go out you'll you'll, you'll see that uh, structure here it's again held by these strings and the moment you cut these strings the whole thing collapses okay so this is very different from buildings which are buildings such as these which are stabilized by compression 
or the or the you know uh, these are these are stabilized because of tension okay? and uh, there's been an interesting proposal that the cell the, the, the way to understand the mechanical behavior of the cell is to under, is to think of it as a tensegrity structure okay now what we have been trying to uh, do is via this uh, this formalism we would like to arrive at a dynamical theory of tensegrity writing down dynamical equations for the for myosin um, myosin actin and microtubules and hopefully this will give us a dynamical theory by which we can understand uh, tensegrity like structures okay so what I, uh, I've talked so far is about um, about the patterning of forces forming singular lines uh, arising uh, from the action of force generation and force and force sensing by myosin on actin okay uh, so these form the, the singular force uh, chains that I talked about so, and so this is the the stress fibers and these stress fibers are are stabilized in a finite cell is stabilized by boundary elements called focal adhesions this uh, ensuing structure uh, uh, exhibits fragile elasticity and this may coexist with excitability such as turning waves uh, such as traveling waves and uh, swap phases okay and as I said uh, what we'd love to do now is to try to uh, uh, formalism for a dynamical theory of uh, tensegrity the work this entire work was done uh, by this very talented postdoc Ayan whose face I can't show you now by Ayan and Satarshi who is a student there and there's some previous work in collaboration with uh, my experimental colleagues uh, Toma Lekwi which uh, uh, discussed the uh, emergence of traveling waves in tissues okay, using a similar kind of uh, uh, formalism so I'll yeah thank you for your attention and if you have any questions I'll so because you need this very fragile balance between compression and tension right uh, is this how it gets to quickly remodel and become is that what you're trying yes yes, yes exactly and then how does it not get buffeted by fluctuations and just get washed out meaning how does it maintain right. despite whatever else is how, how is it robust yeah so this is where I think these uh, focal additions uh, play a role so in the if you take a cell and uh, detach it from a, a substrate then uh, you lose all these focal additions and then the actin meshwork totally collapses okay so it there are these pivots that are there yeah yeah Okay. Yeah, I presume. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this thing is very similar to gravitational collapse and, and the finite time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There also they talk about gravitational collapse. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, in the in the context of the mechanical metamaterials. Yeah. Uh, what would be the Poisson ratio of such kind of structures? Would it be by any chance? Yeah, so negative? right. So uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, work recently on constructing these mechanical matter materials with oxetic properties. So the, uh, the Poisson ratio is negative for those okay. things. But here it can be really very negative. Very negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, for example, even origami structures. Yes, yes, absolutely. Can, can yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? You know, one of the things that happens here is that you can, uh, the system can dynamically explore many different kinds of marginal elastic states. So it can become uh, an, what's called an ether state, you know, where uh, the, uh, where, uh, uh, B plus mu that the, the, the compression modulus plus the shear modulus is equal to zero okay uh, and it can become a fluid what's called a fluid uh, elastic state where the shear modulus is zero with compression it's, it's still an elastic system but the uh, shear modulus is zero so these are called marginal elastic states and this system of actomyosin can explore all these uh, these different uh, configurations uh, I have a question. So, um, you mentioned about the 
passive uh, non-linearity about uh, you haven't yeah. considered unbinding yeah. but I guess unbinding will give you only the softening kind of thing but mm. this passively these systems also so uh, strength stiffening yes. Yes. so uh, that kind of non-linearity uh, do you need to consider so so in this case we have assumed that the background passive system is a simple system a linear elasticity linear elasticity and all these uh, interesting effects are happening as a consequence of, uh, of uh, activity. But you could make it more complicated as you see. You could make the background itself uh, have strain stiffening uh, coming from unbinding of cross-linkers. Okay. That's, that's how it, it typically happens. It, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you can have stretching of cross-linkers also, the yes, flexible yes, ones. exactly. So this is, people have studied a lot uh, on this a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can make your background theory more and more complicated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.